Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning from Luke 12, 22 to 34, and you can see this in your pew Bibles, has a section labeled, Do Not Be Anxious. A simple enough phrase, but if you were to say that to someone in the throes of anxiety, their response would be something like, that's easy for you to say. And they would be correct. To not be anxious is an easy thing to say. Even when we try really hard and with the best of intentions, we still find ourselves worrying. What worries you right now? The economy is not doing so hot these days. Maybe you're worried about money. You just had to spend money to fix your car or an appliance in your home. It wasn't planned and it was more expensive than what you were thinking it would be. The worry comes. Will there be enough money when I need it? You have seen your grocery bill going up for the last year. Gas is more expensive. Maybe you have had to dip into your savings for those unplanned expenses more than you would have liked because the essentials are eating up your paycheck. Or maybe your worry is about the future. Will my roof leak? My furnace is old. Can I replace it if it fails? My car is getting up there in miles. Will I be able to fix it this time? Can I afford a new car without taking on more debt? On and on, the worries come into your head, piling up until you're overwhelmed. And then someone has the gall to say to you, do not be anxious, easy for you to say. Yet today, in our gospel, this is what Jesus is saying. Well, what Jesus says is more precise. He says, do not be anxious about your life. Jesus is no stranger to suffering and sacrifice. He isn't simply saying, do not be anxious about your life, because he is rich and has never experienced the fear of not having enough. He is speaking from a higher authority, an authority that is intimately aware of worry, fear, and anxiety. If he knows all that, how can Jesus say, do not be anxious about your life? He can say it because he has come to bring a treasure that overcomes all fear. A treasure, unlike anything that has ever been seen or given. A treasure that cannot be taken away. A treasure that doesn't decay or rust. A treasure that cannot be destroyed. The first verse of our gospel reading, verse 22, connects the parable of the rich fool, last week's gospel reading, with the teachings Jesus speaks here. Another important thing to note is that we have a change in Jesus' audience. Before, in the earlier parable recitation, Jesus was speaking to the crowds, but now he is addressing only his disciples. In the following verses, Jesus explains in greater detail the parable he just spoke to the crowds. He continues to teach about possessions, but now he connects one's attitude towards possessions with the kingdom of God. Jesus begins with the most basic concerns of earthly life, food and clothing. He's going to give 10 imperatives or commands concerning what life is about in the next 12 verses. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. You might have guessed the first one, do not be anxious. Why shouldn't I be anxious about food and clothing? Anyone with sense would concern themselves with those. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. There is more to life than your next meal. There is more to you 
than what you wear. In other words, if you focus too much on those, you will miss out on the truth. You will miss out on the more of life. The second and third commands are to consider or carefully observe the ravens and the lilies. The ravens don't toil for and store up their food, yet God feeds them. The lilies are arrayed more beautifully than the most glorious human wealth can buy, yet they do not toil. What does this teach us to consider? Jesus is teaching his disciples about the nature of God's provision in this world. It is his task to provide for these needs, not ours. By comparing our efforts to that of the raven and the lily, Jesus highlights how little our toil truly provides. He further emphasizes our inability to wrestle this task away from God by asking rhetorical questions about our ability. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? It seems that relying on ourselves and focusing on material possessions is a futile and false work. True provision can only come from God. And that is good news, not bad. Of how much more value are you than the birds? How much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Consider, carefully observe, how God provides in the world. He does the same providing for him and you. That is his job. And, we, and when we take it on, not only will we fail to do it, but we will begin to think life is simply about those things. But you are more, and life is more than these things. The fourth and fifth commands move us away from focusing on the necessities of earthly life to focus on the kingdom of God. Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. Why should I not seek these? Your father knows that you need them. The whole world looks for these. He knows. Again, that is his job. So what should we seek then? The sixth command, instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. This command plants us firmly now into where Jesus is leading his disciples. The disciples of Jesus do not forget to eat, nor must they go without clothes. But the disciples of Jesus are not to be worried about these things. The disciples seek God's kingdom and let God take care of that earthly stuff. Isn't this actually true? Think about it for a moment in our own lives. In our lives, when we have worried about making ends meet, when something did need fixing and we weren't sure we could pay for it, or when we were worried that if something goes wrong right now, we couldn't pay for it, hasn't God provided for your needs? Not has he given everything you think you need, but he has given us what we truly need instead. If he hadn't, you wouldn't be able to be here. You would think that with a track record like that, we would be able to not worry. What about the kingdom of God? How do I seek it? What do I have to do? The seventh command, fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Wait. So seeking the kingdom is more like waiting on God? I'm not looking for it myself, but he will find me 
and bring it to me? He knows us well, doesn't he? As soon as Jesus tells us to seek something, we are back in the world of our work and our striving and our earning something. But he cuts us off right away. Fear not. Your heavenly Father joyfully brings it to you. Wait on him. The last three commands come out quickly. Now that you know how and what the more of life is about, point to the truth of the treasures of heaven by selling and giving. Sell your possessions. Give to the needy. Lastly, point to the truth by storing up the treasure of heaven, not the treasures of earth. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. At this point, you might be wondering why Jesus is so concerned with your possessions. In reality, Jesus isn't concerned at all about your possessions. He is concerned about your heart. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He knows the fallen human heart is easily led astray. It desi its desires are warped. It can lead us away from what life is really about. Jesus doesn't want that because it leads us away from him. The more of life, the more of you is Jesus. We started out asking how Jesus could command of us to not be anxious, especially since he knows what it means to suffer lack of what we truly need and to make sacrifices. It is because he speaks of a treasure that overrides all the worries and wants of this life. He has commanded us to let go of the treasures of this world, give them away in faith. Seek the kingdom instead. Store up this new treasure because it is imperishable. So what is the treasure and how do I store it up? The treasure is Jesus and his gifts. Today, this very moment, you are making money bags that do not grow old. You are making them by waiting on the Lord. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That kingdom is Jesus. In his house this morning and every Sunday until he returns, he gives you the kingdom, the treasure that does not fail. He gives you Jesus, the word made flesh. He gives you forgiveness of sins. He gives you life everlasting. Your heart is here where the treasure does not fade, cannot be taken, and will never be destroyed. Your heart is with Jesus, the unfading treasure of heaven. In his glorious name, amen.